All right. So one of the focus of the MC or a focus of the MC is um, reaching out to those that are in a state of homelessness. And Rob asked us to just share from our personal experience some of the challenges, blessings, and learnings. And so I will do that. Um, so I'm going to start with the blessings. And um, I meet a friend about once a week for lunch. And sometimes we'll go toward Park Meadows. And as I drive that way, I see this elderly man, and he's holding a sign. And one time, I, I rolled down my window. I didn't have anything to give him, but I had like toothpaste and a toothbrush. And I, and I offered it to him, and he's like, I don't have any teeth. And so he wasn't interested in that. But the next time that I saw him, I rolled down, and I said, I got some candy. <laughs> and he was most willing to take that. And he was like, nobody gives candy. And he was so happy. And for that moment, he was happy. And so that was a blessing for me. Um, as far as challenges, uh, for me personally, it's connecting. It's like, um, what kind of conversation do we have? Do we have, what do we have to connect on? And so that's been a challenge for me. Um, and as far as learnings, um, you know, I, I do think of the, the prodigal son and that story and the elder brother. And the elder brother is self-righteous. And he misses the fact that his brother returns because he's focused on the fact that his inheritance is now shrunk with the return of, of his brother. Um, but the learning for me is the realization that that description does not fit the kingdom, which is infin infinite. And uh, that there is um, many chances and infinite amount of chances um, that each of these um, individuals should receive, and uh, and uh, that reflects the kingdom. So that's my sharing. Um, I think Kevin touched on um, a piece that it, I think is very common for people who live on the streets, um, and that is just um, a level of invisibility. And um, we make bags um, that we hand out to um, people who are asking. And um, we invite them to come and join us at the gathering on Sunday morning. And um, it's just really cool the way that um, my kids now, if they see someone, they're like, Mom, where's a bag? Yeah. Um, and Mom, why do you want Mom? A and so, and if, w I mean, if we have a bag or if we don't have a bag, and um, we'll, uh, we'll sometimes pray for that person. And I just, I see <laughs> my children especially seeing people. Um, that that they would not necessarily see, and that has been really beautiful. I think um, a challenge that I think we all feel, I know Kevin and I do, is um, the it, it's really the need is so great. Um, the harvest is great, and um, and yeah, I think that's a parallel. And I think listening to the Spirit and um, choosing over and over again to to let Jesus be the Messiah and not me, um, and to say no, um, and to have boundaries because having boundaries when you're working with um, people who have not had boundaries um, is is very humbling and painful, but so so important. Um, so I think that's that's something, Mark. Are you? Yeah, come on up, Mark. Thank you, thank you, guys. I think I think the Montgomerys are the oldest members of our missional community, meaning like they've been with us the longest. <laughs> that came out really badly. <laughs> That's not what I meant, Mont. <laughs> Mont forgives me a lot of times, I think. So, <laughs> but just share what the Lord's doing um, in the missional community and how it's impacted you. So. Well, obviously, our focus is with the uh, urban survivalists, is a term I like to use. Um, I think the thing that I'm learning is uh, we're going to have to sacrifice to work for people who have need. Uh, we sacrifice their time. We're going to, uh, this year, we're going to sacrifice actual cost because we're, we're doing the meals for, the, for those folks that are involved. Um, and it's, it's good for us to be able to do that. I, I enjoy the opportunity that I have to sit down with 
with some guys, and the few times that I've done it, I've developed some decent relationships with some of these folks, and I enjoy that. It it helps me to uh, understand them and to appreciate more of what God has done for me. Mm. Thanks, Mike. I think um, I'll just share briefly, too. I think the missional community has taught me and Jewel over the years what, um, I mean, we part of the goal for us together in the way that we are reaching out to those that are vulnerable is is that we would see them and help them know that they're made in God's image and there's value there. Like that is just beautiful that they have beauty and talent and skill. They reflect God um, because often, you know, uh, that can be ignored. And what I, I think is awesome is that this missional community has not only reflected God to us, but has also reflected Jesus's body to us because there's a diversity varying gifts and skills and abilities and passions and um, to see them all come together in their own unique ways to serve and love and care for those that are around them has just been so challenging and even um, convicting, I think, to Jewel and I. So uh, we're grateful for you guys. And I'm just going to pray over over our missional community here and uh, thank God for them. God, thank you so much for the Littleton missional community. Um, Thank you for all of the folks that uh, we call family, the opportunity to do life um, with them. I just think of um, the ones that are standing here. Also, Sue, who's not here this morning, and Candy, and Madison, and the Stitchers, and Tim and Kim. Um, God, uh, these people are such a gift um, to to uh, to us, uh, to Jewel and I, um, but they I know that they are uh, a reflection of you and your glory and your kindness and gentleness, and welcome, and acceptance, and love through Jesus. So help us, God, as we continue to face into this. Um, There are struggles and challenges and sacrifices, as I mentioned, but we know that you're teaching us more about who you are and what you've done through them. So thank you, and continue to send us with the Spirit in Jesus' name. Thank you, guys. Okay, um, so today... Um, Mark and Chas are out of town. They're not exactly out of town. They're just taking uh, a little bit of uh, rest time. So please be in prayer for them. And our text uh, today is in Philippians 3, 12 through 16, which mom read a couple of minutes ago. So if you want to um, get yourselves there, either in your Bibles or if you have uh, one of the notebooks that we've been using, you can use that too. And, uh, And also, while you're getting there, I would love to hear um, from you guys. Does anyone have a story? Can, um, a story of a time in your life. Let me get, okay. A time in your life when the trajectory of your life, and maybe even because of uh, that time, not just the trajectory, but maybe the fundamental nature of reality to you uh, and all that you believed was changed in an instant. Um. Uh, I don't know what, what, what exactly to, we, we call those crossroads, perhaps. Does anybody have a story of that? I'll share, so, so you guys can think about that if you want to, sh- maybe you have one in your mind and you don't want to share it, that's okay too. Um, but uh, if you have one that you want to share, I'd love to hear about that. Um, one that comes to mind for me, um, I actually have two. So the first one is, um, I can remember being 19 years old. And I was in college, I was a sophomore in college, and I went to a friend's house um, for Thanksgiving. And we were, I think we were watching Zorro. <laughs> um, the, the one with uh, that one. Yeah, it is that old. That movie is that old. I can't even believe it. Um, we were watching that movie, and my friend came and said, hey, somebody's on the phone for you. It's your brother. And I... And I think before, before, I even, before I even began to talk with him, I knew what he was going to say. And he said, Rob, dad is dead. Um, and in an instant, the trajectory of life was different. I didn't know, I mean, everything that I thought we were going toward, that my life was going to be, was shaped around his, his continuing to be alive. And in a moment, that changed, and I'm likely here and not somewhere else even today because of that. Um, so that's a sad one, but life-changing, life-altering. Um, I have a happier one. <laughs> I can remember um, the morning of 
uh, May 30th, 2005, that by the end of the day, in just a few words, right, my, the fundamental nature of what reality was for me was going to change because Julie and I said, yes, we will be with each other until death on that day. And, uh, and so our lives had to be different, right? Like you walk around, you're no longer like yourself. You're no longer who you are by yourself. It's like God, knit to get, God knits together these two people and makes one flesh out of them. Um, and I don't, that's a mysterious, right? We're individuals and yet we're not. Um, so, so in an instant, when Pastor Collard said, I give you whatever he said, ro- uh, same thing as he said to you guys last week, <laughs> it was all different, right? So that's a happy one. Does anyone have, does anyone have a story like that that you'd like to share? Okay, um, Pippi, let me grab the mic here. Here we go. Oh, no, I'm, I'm grabbing it for you. <laughs> It's on. It is, is it on. on. Okay. Um, so mine's kind of, there's two parts of it, but um, on August 2nd of 2008, my little sister called me and uh, she's like, do you want to be a mom? And I'm like, yeah, someday, you know, I kind of need to get married and uh, I need to, you know, get a better job than childcare because it doesn't pay super well and all these things, you know, so that I can adopt. And she's like, well, how about December 1st? And <laughs> I hung up on her. <laughs> um, so... Um, Obviously, that's she found out at five months that she was pregnant with Savannah, and um, my little sister gave me Savannah. Mm. Um, and so I guess the second part of that is when she was actually born on November 19th. She was born via C-section, and I was in the operating room, and the nurses handed her to me. And uh, life definitely changed because I went from you know never being able to have children, hoping to be a mom one day, to having my lovely little girl. Mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. So, yeah. This is a happy trajectory change. You want Eric? We all know yours taught. No, just kidding. <laughs> uh, okay. <laughs> um, so back in high school, I used to be a terrible person. Like Val can attest to that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it was, it was, a s- <laughs> it was my senior year. And we had just lost a basketball game, and I was mm. very, very upset. And I got into my car, my brand new car that my mom just bought for me, like as an early graduation present. And I sped off, and I uh, lost control of the vehicle. And it was like at that moment, I kind of, I kind of accepted that I was about to die because I looked mm. at the speedometer and it said like 90 miles an hour mm. as I lost control, and I hit somebody head on and they like flipped their vehicle. And I pretty much thought I was dead, um, but then I came back to consciousness and like got out of the car and went to the other car and I had to like pull the guy out. And at that moment I kind of realized that I was living a very selfish life. And I sor- it was sort of an existential moment kind of thing where mm-hmm. like my choices don't just affect me, but like I almost killed another person and um, all my friends from the basketball game were there at the crash scene, hmm. and I was like, I, I would have let so many people down for my reckless behavior. And I feel like at that moment, I, I stopped living in a way that only my choices mattered. Um, mm. I don't know, it, it was a very life-changing moment for me. Hmm. And it felt like, it felt like I, I was given a second chance. Mm. So, mm. yeah. That's good. Wow. Thanks for sharing that. Andrew? Um, so some of you that have been in an MC with me probably know a little bit of my story, but I'll try to keep it short. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but when I was in middle school, and middle school can be a tumultuous time for anyone, but I changed schools. The church we were going to was going through a split, so I basically didn't have any friends like over the course of a couple of months. Uh, And my family, especially my parents, just started going through some very serious issues that I won't get into that needed to be worked out. But there was just this time in my life where I suddenly, you know, had this sense of all my friends are gone. I don't have any friends. My family is unreliable because they've got other issues to work through. 
it felt like everything I'd come to depend on in my little life was taken away. Mm. Um, and that could have gone to a very dark place. I could see easily how things could have gone differently, but somehow in that God reached out to me and said, you've been relying on all these things, rely on me. Mm. You know, all these things will let you down, I won't. Mm. And it's not like it's always been easy, but I do remember just a moment in all that where somehow God reached out to me and, and said, you know, you're mine, I will be reliable, I will mm. take care of you. And, you know, I do obviously have friends again. My family has been able to work through their issues. There's been a lot of happy endings. Things could have gone differently. But just, you know, you talk about a crossroads. I just remember that moment where, you know, God spoke to me somehow and all that. Mm. Uh, otherwise, if I were on my own, it wouldn't have worked out very well. Hmm. That's good. Oh, Jackie, over here. Let's just have an Anglewood MC sharing <laughs> moment. <laughs> um, so a few years back, just before Chad and I got married, we had we were poor, 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 like lived in a barn with a bathroom not attached. Um, it was gross. So we had applied for a loan to get our first fifth wheel together because, you know, obviously when we got married, we were going to hit the road for his apprenticeship. And Chad had some bad credit because he hadn't made very great decisions after the um, Marine Corps, and I had pretty much no credit. So we thought, this is a lost cause. And I remember getting a phone call at work that we had been approved for a loan to mm. buy our fifth wheel for the exact amount to cover for this private party deal that we had found. And at that moment, it was like, complete life-changing, and it was just mm. God's plan fell into place piece by piece by piece, and his protective hand was just on us for the entire situation between a tire blowing on the truck when we picked up the trailer and sleeping in a Walmart parking lot in one of the creepiest places in California, and it was just amazing how much God led us through, mm. starting with that one phone call. Mm. Wow, wow. I love how you guys are all giving praise to God through this. It's just a constant theme. Um, mine has similarities to Eric's. Um, I kind of, I was 16, and um, just there were a lot of things. I think I just wanted to go through that phase of questioning as a teenager and just wanting to, um, like, live be growing up in a very, in a good way, in a very protected and safe home, there were just a lot of things that walking away from God and just wanting to experience a lot of things. And also, I was at that age where I had a lot more independence, and, and I think a lot of the parental control factor was had been taken away because um, I had my own, my own car and all that kind of stuff. And so, anyway, a short version of the story is... Um, I was joyriding with some friends, and I had some friends that had gotten on the back of my vehicle, and one of them was a kid, um, and we turned this corner, and he fell off the back of my car. There was a rock, hit his head on the rock, had to be airlifted to um, the nearest hospital an hour and a half away, and almost died. He had to have, like, brain surgery and all this crazy stuff, and I think my version of that was... Eric says existential, like I just, it was just this total like awakening moment of it, uh, it would have been my responsibility, mm -hmm. like this, this kid would have died because of, of me, you know, because I was, I was just wanting to like try out all these things in my life and just not be the good, safe, you know, kid anymore. I wanted to just whatever. I just wanted to be my own person and try all these new things. And I, it was just like, if it's possible for there to be like a, a voice from God saying like, nope, like you need to stop right now. And so I see that as, I always see that as a turning point in mm. my life of like, mm. I knew, I knew that that was God saying like, that is not what I want for you. I want, I want you to, to, to love me, to live like in, in the way that I want you to live. Mm. And this needs to happen right now. Mm. Um, anyways, so, mm. yeah. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. Wow. Um, well, we could probably do this for a really long time, so I'm going to turn this off for a minute. Um, Paul has a story like that. Um, so I'm going to show it to you. Can you? Do you have it? Oh, yeah, let me read it to you then. Yeah, well, I'll just read it. 
I'll just read it because uh, I want you guys. I want you guys to hear this, and I I got this one for the kids too. <laughs> but the idea is these crossroads sort of stories, right? Um, there are times when your entire life is moving in one direction. Sometimes by choice. Sometimes not so much by choice. And something occurs to you, or uh, happens to you, that in a moment completely upends that. So I w- I'll, read, I'll read this one. Thanks. Thanks, Val. I appreciate it. I got a lot of these. Because I want to bring you back into, here we are in Philippians, right? And we know this is Paul here writing this. And I think that, especially in this passage, we're about ready to get into here in a second, um, because it's been so often applied in some weird ways. Um, sometimes we can forget what was underneath of what was underneath of this, and what Paul's own story is, even as he's writing this. So, here we go. Okay, of all the of all the people, you can roll the you can roll the video behind me if you want to. Of all the people who kept the rules, Saul was the best. I'm good at being good. He'd tell you. He was very proud and very good, but he was not very nice. Saul hated anyone who loved Jesus. He traveled around looking for them. He wanted to catch them and put them in prison. He wanted everyone to forget all about Jesus. You You got it? Very proud and very good. But he wasn't very nice. Oh, we'll let this go. He's got a great voice. Saul hated anyone who loved Jesus. He traveled around looking for them. He wanted to catch them and put them in prison. He wanted everyone to forget all about Jesus. He didn't believe Jesus was the rescuer, and he didn't believe Jesus was alive either. You see, Saul had never met Jesus. So, one day, Jesus met Saul. Saul was on his way to Damascus when suddenly a dazzling light flashed like lightning. It was brighter than the sun. It was too bright. Saul shielded his eyes and fell to the ground. He heard a loud voice. It was too loud. It gave Saul a headache. Saul, Saul, said the loud voice. Why are you fighting me? Lord, Saul answered. Who are you? I am Jesus, said the voice. When you hurt my friends, you are hurting me too. Saul's whole body trembled. Go to the city, Jesus said. I'll tell you what to do. When Saul opened his eyes, he couldn't see. His helpers had to hold his hand and lead him like a little child. Saul was blind for three whole days, and yet it was as if he was seeing for the very first time. Meanwhile, there was a man called Ananias who loved Jesus. Jesus came to him in a dream. Go to Saul and pray for him, and I will make him see again. Ananias knew all about Saul and how he hated Jesus' followers. Lord, he has come to hurt us. But Jesus told Ananias, Saul is the one I've chosen to tell the whole world who I am. So Ananias went to Saul. Brother Saul, Ananias said, it was Jesus you met on the road. And Ananias prayed for Saul. Suddenly, Saul could see again, but he saw everything differently. He wasn't mean anymore. He even changed his name from Saul to Paul, which means small and humble, the very opposite of proud. And do you know what Ananias' name means? The Lord is full of grace. Grace is just another word for gift, which is funny because that's just what Paul's message was all about from then on. It's not about keeping rules, Paul told people. You don't have to be good at being good for God to love you. You just have to believe what Jesus has done and follow him because it's not about trying, it's about trusting. It's not about rules. 
It's about grace, God's free gift that cost him everything. Thanks, Doc. I appreciate that. That guy's voice is way better than mine. So, Paul's backstory, and I got a lot to say, so I'm going to say it fast. Please hang on, because <laughs> I don't have much time here. Um, but Paul had this same instant, the same instant where his entire trajectory of life changed. And that's the backdrop for our passage today in Philippians chapter 3, verses 12 through 16. For someone like Paul, he, w- he, w- he, was, he was a Jewish person, right? But he also was a Pharisee. And so for someone like Paul with a Jewish Pharisaical hope that he had, Jesus' resurrection was that life-altering thing for him. So this, this chart right here shows a, kind of a visual of what the Jewish expectation was, right? So on the left side, we have uh, generally, from reading, the, from, reading the, uh, from the prophets and from the Torah and the different things that they had in their, uh, in their history, this is what they were expecting to happen, right? Here they are, right in the middle of this oppression uh, by the Roman government. They've been oppressed for quite a while. It's not just the Roman government, but this whole list of folks that have been uh, oppressing the Jewish people, and so what they were looking for was they they can they considered that currently we they were in the present age, which was an age ruled by sin, death, evil, and Satan, and that when when the Spirit came and the Messiah and the Messiah came, that that age was going to end, and He was going to bring in the new age or the age to come, which was the age when all of the opposite of those things was the case instead: knowledge of God, love joy, justice would reign in God's kingdom. And alongside of that, alongside of that is that on that last day, when God removes the present age, restoring the kingdom to Israel, he would seat the Messiah on the front, on the throne, and he would raise the dead into it. In fact, we get a little hint of their view in John 11. When Jesus raises Lazarus, he goes to Martha, right? And he says, do you do you believe in resurrection? She goes, I know, Lord, on the last day that the dead will ra- be raised. Um, and then Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. Jesus is saying, let me clarify that for you to her. But their expectation was that the Messiah would come and that there would be this general resurrection of the righteous into the kingdom. Okay? And so for Pharisees in particular, the sect of Judaism that Paul was a part of, They felt that apostasy or walking away from God was what had led to the oppression of the Jews and that not only did the Mosaic law need to be practiced and protected, but that non-Jews, since they were really the source of Israel's uh, apostasy, needed to be expelled. Separation and obedience were their core values of the Pharisees. And this is who Paul is, right? You can see this, right? And so to him... To Paul, it was the nation's very hope of resurrection and entrance into God's literal kingdom that you be the kind of person who keeps all of the laws, who has the pedigree that we talked about several weeks ago that is right here in Philippians 3. If you look just up a little bit, you see him talking about his resume, circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, the tribe of Benjamin, Hebrews of the Hebrews, as to the law of Pharisee. As to zeal, he persecuted the church. As to righteousness, that, w- that is under the law, blameless. The very hope of the, of the restoration of the nation and of resurrection itself was that sort of resume for a guy like Paul. So you can see then why he would have been a persecutor of the way of Jesus, right? Because the uproar that, that they were causing was al- not just alarming, I, it, was tra- it was literally transforming the city, and it was moving out from there, and it was going to undermine everything that he believed. It, it was threatening his hope of resurrection. But then, he met the risen Jesus himself. And meeting Jesus made everything change. And you might say, then that Philippians 3, 7 to 11, which was where uh, Mark left off last week, is a snapshot of how Paul's view of the Messiah changed. He says, whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of the Messiah. 
Indeed, I count everything as loss. All that pedigree before that was getting me into the kingdom is loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I've suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible, I may attain the resurrection of the dead. In summary, knowing Christ has both Jesus' physical resurrection with all, the, and if his physical rising from the dead, right, with all of the power and promise that goes with that, as well as the hope of our own physical resurrection at its center. Knowing Christ in the sense in which Paul is using this term and Christ being presently bodily alive, mediated to us by His Spirit, as well as His promising our own bodily resurrection are absolutely intertwined. To know Christ is to know that He's alive. You can't know Christ if He's not alive. And if he's not going to promise new life both presently and bodily in the future for us, Paul himself actually says in another place, what's the point? You could have translated what he says in 1 Corinthians 15 when he talks about resurrection as him saying, if there's not resurrection, what is the point? So when we get to our passage today, the main takeaway that I I would say for Paul and us is that the resurrection of Jesus Christ is real. And wholly pressing into its reality and actually living as if it were true is at the heart of Christian maturity. This is what Paul is expressing to us from his own story, his change of trajectory, and how he says now his life is postured. I love the doctrine of resurrection. It's probably, uh, I think I geeked out on union with Christ a couple of weeks ago. Do you know union with Jesus is not possible if the resurrection is not true? What is resurrection? The central issue of the fall is death. And we could say that in the biblical story, separation from life in God was the core of the death chosen by Adam and Eve. It has effects on human bodies and on all of existence so that death, even though it's parasitic fundamentally, right? Death is not supposed to be there and it leeches off of all of the goodness that God made. It has become, though, a universal reality. Um, Separation from God. And when Jesus came, he came to take on the core issue of death so that the whole of death's effects could be reversed for all of his creation. In Jesus' own death, he both experienced death's core, which is that separation from God, as well as its effects. His body physically ceased to be animated and went into the grave. I can remember a time when uh, maybe I was 19 or 20 and sitting there thinking, here we have this gospel, right? And I sure I believe in the forgiveness of sins, but what does it matter if I don't believe in resurrection? It matters a great deal because in physically rising from the grave, Jesus demonstrates that he has beaten both the essential nature of death, separation from God, as well as death's physical effects. The, the corruption of our bodies. Jesus died a physical death, but then he rose physically out of the grave. It's very literally creation power reapplied. The same power that he used to speak into existence everything that is there, he also used to reanimate his physical body to show that he is still that creative authority over all of heaven and earth. And so, His physical death and then his physical resurrection validated his claim to be Messiah, the the one who would rescue and restore all of creation, but it also validated his claim to be Yahweh, God himself, the two in one. His resurrection actually ends the rule of death and inaugurates God's kingdom, not just for humanity, but for all of creation. And his resurrection is just the beginning the first of many. And I'm not going to read the whole passage, but go read 1 Corinthians 15 sometimes, sometime because you'll see that Jesus' resurrection promises the rest of our resurrections. He plans to resurrect the bodies of all of those who 
And Paul changes the terminology from death to falling asleep. Those who fall asleep in Jesus, God will raise from the dead. And this signifies the fullest sense of of the union between our physical bodies and our fellowship with God himself, all set to right again. The breath that God breathed into Adam in order to make him a living being, that restored in our physical bodies. This will be, uh, God is giving us this comprehensive restoration of what was lost with, when that breath of God was rejected by Adam and Eve. And this will be into a resurrected creation, the new heavens and the new earth. In fully reuniting heaven and earth, God makes the fact that he presently re- reigns by his word the absolute, universally non-ignorable reality. See, we live in a place right now where Jesus has said, right, all authority in heaven and on earth is given to me. And yet, we have this brokenness and corruption. It is not the non-ignorable reality at this moment, but in resurrection of our bodies into a renewed creation, there will be no possibility of ignoring it anymore. And so presently, we experience new life, resurrection in him, but not in its fullest sense. But in the future, we will wholly experience it in new bodies, in a new creation, God bringing everything back into harmony once again. And in the meantime, he's commissioned us as ambassadors of that place, right? Demonstrating a resurrection-formed life until all of the citizens of that new place have been found. So, resurrection then, Paul ending verse, uh, verse 11, verse 10 and 11, saying that resurrection is the power that he wanted to know, and that he is by any means possible chasing after the resurrection from the dead. Resurrection then becomes the referent of the many pronouns that are in our passage this morning. For instance, verse 12, not that I have already obtained this or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. We need to know what this and it are. Well, if resurrection is the referent, we could read this again this way. He could, he's saying, I'm not yet complete in Christ. I haven't reached fullness of that sort of completeness yet in a re- because that's in a resurrection body, but Jesus took hold of me so that I could live in light of resurrection now. And because of that, I continue to press into a resurrection-minded way of life until it's fully realized. Then he moves into this race metaphor, right? You ever, uh, d- I saw this um, video going around, I think it was last week, of this guy who broke the two-hour record for the marathon. Anybody see that, that video? Yeah, like, amazing. What kind of focus does a guy like that have to have? Now, conversely, um, my daughter was playing soccer a couple of weeks ago, and they switched goalies at the half on her team. Now, the goalie on, at the first, uh, in the first half was focused. She was zeroed in on what her job was. She was there. Nothing got past her. And uh, for, a, for a, a, a fifth grader, man, she had a pretty good punt. Um, but the second half of the game, there was a girl um, who literally, like, they scored on her as she was, like, watching, I think it was an airplane passing by. In the middle of the game, all this activity is happening around her, and she's looking up, and, the, you know, the ball just goes by. That's not the kind of mentality that the guy who just broke the two-hour record had, right? So Paul is drawing on that, that he's drawing on that race metaphor with all of its focus all of its context, that when you're on this track, right, you, you know where you are, you know who you are, and all of your reality is shaped by the, that course, right? And, and he is saying that resurrection is the track for us in this case. And so he goes into verse 13, and he says, I don't consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. And you could, you could think of it this way. In verse 13, he's saying there are still elements that I'm working on where I'm out of step with a resurrection reality. 
with, with what it means that the, the power of Jesus' resurrection and the fact that he's going to raise all of us from the dead, there's still elements that I'm working on where I'm not quite there, but the former things that seemed powerful to me are actually forgettable. All of that stuff, right? The, the stuff that was formerly going to achieve him resurrection, his being a Hebrew of the Hebrews, of the, uh, as to the law of Pharisee, that pushing back on apostasy uh, by, by a, um, a, a so-called uprightness of life that was aligned with the law that caused him to persecute Jesus, that was his hope of resurrection. And he is now saying, man, when I have considered the resurrect, I've met the risen Jesus face to face now, and I know that he's promised the resurrection of our bodies, that it is an inev- inevitable thing. So all that stuff that I was trusting in for my hope of entering the God's kingdom and experiencing resurrection, it's forgettable. Jesus' present resurrection power and the fullest effect of it in our own resurrection bodies is what he's saying he is looking forward to now. And so in verse 14, what's actually valuable, the prize, the end of the race is what he's pressing toward now. Namely, the consummation of Jesus' resurrection, the effects of Jesus' resurrection on all of creation for for us as people and for uh, uh, for all of creation. That resurrection then becomes the new trajectory of life. The upward call, the call of God on his life. Some translations say the high call, the the call in which God has put on his life now is to be living his life on that track. The call of God into Christ and Christ's resurrection power and the resurrection reality that he's given us. So then verse 15, he would say, let, us, let, a, let those of us who are mature think this way. Maturity is marked by the resurrection trajectory of life. And it's something that we should continue to press into, we should eagerly seek, we should align to, just like that runner and all of his preparation and then his time on the track, uh, in, in, which ended in him beating a two-hour mark. Resurrection. I love the doctrine of resurrection. So here's a couple of summary statements for us. Resurrection matters. I think it, it matters so much. Paul says this elsewhere, right? Like he, you can see how he said this is what his life needs to be about, living in light of the fact that Jesus is, is alive and physically alive and that Jesus is also going to make all of the rest of us have raised bodies as well. If it's not true, Paul says elsewhere, nothing else actually matters. Like we're, we're hopeless if this isn't true. And so if it matters, it ought to be a life-altering reality. But then this one. Even Paul struggled with it being a life-altering reality. Doesn't he say, I don't, I don't, I, I, I don't, haven't made it fully my own, but I continue to press into it. Do you feel the difference in posture between that and the, as to the law, I was a Pharisee. As to righteousness that was through the law, I was blameless. It was a confidence in myself because I have to, right? If there's a step out of line, I'm not part of the kingdom. I'm not part of resurrection. But in Jesus, it is just objectively true that he is alive. And that he has, Paul has said in this passage that we're in, that Jesus has made him his own. And if you have been made, if you've been owned by Jesus, then resurrection is your reality, regardless of if you step out of line of its truth or not. Isn't there some hope in that for us? God's not looking for perfection with us as we run this race. But we do struggle, right? And we'll find that it is supposed to be a life-altering reality, and and there's a couple of things that we do tend to struggle with. So I want to put these up here. I think that we often tend to live as if personal achievement will save us. Paul said that personal achievement was forgettable. But don't we so often tend to live our lives in that trajectory of that I have to pull it off? 
I have to make my future secure. I was thinking about the, the poem Invictus. Has anybody seen the movie um, about Nelson Mandela and the apartheid? It's a great movie, right? But the poem Invictus is heartbreaking. And it ends with, I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. Anybody who's really honest with themselves is going to say, that is not going to work. You can't just pull yourself up by your own bootstraps. We fail over and over and over and over again. And there are so many things that press in on us from the world story that says we have to pull it off. There's a new one every day, a new issue that we have to, we have to perform perfectly for or else everything's going to blow up and future, our future is going to be absolutely toast. There's a new one every day. This one isn't going to get us anywhere. We also tend to live as if death is the primary present and future reality. Instead of believing what, what happened at the cross and then in the resurrection, that that was history changing, right? We tend to live as if death's actually the primary reality. And I call this the YOLO way of life, right? Um, and I even looked YOLO up in the <laughs> Urban Dictionary to take a look at this because what do they do? In all the memes, it's, uh, there's, a really, there's a picture of a really stupid thing occurring, right? Um, and then it's, uh, well, you only live once. Uh, there, there's, a, there's a, man, it's all over, and you better just have as much fun as possible, and who cares about all the mistakes that are made along the way? And so I find that one to actually be pretty oppressive as well. So, what difference does it make in the end, then, that resurrection pushes back on both of these mentalities? And maybe I'll take one or two people, take a look at this, and compare and contrast it for me uh, here. As you look at those, and there's more over here, right? Like, I just put up here, what difference, what, what, what is the personal achievement view, or the I am the master of my own fate, what, how do they view things like work, or possessions, or relationships, civil allegiances, circumstances, especially tragedies, right? Uh, our neighborhood, you might even say behavior, health, many other things are part of this. What does the you only live once mentality say about those, and how might that contrast with the resurrection view? Maybe if, you, if somebody wants to comment on this, pick one or two of those and tell me what you see. All right, Brian. Don't take it as wisdom. <laughs> Don't take it as wisdom. <laughs> no, I th I think just like both the personal achievement and the YOLO kind of perspective is all like um, self-focused. Mm. So it's more of both of them are more of what I can get instead of more of what I can give. Mm. That's good. Do you have like one of those bullets over there in particular that you would give an example of? Oh, for me, it's all work. You work. Know, I think you see that where your mindset changes of when you are solely focused on yourself, it's a very selfish mindset. And, and, and you see that in a lot of how we interact in a, in a work setting. Mm. And when you, you have that kind of blessing mentality through your work, it's what gifts have Christ given me to actually bless others. Ah, yeah, I love that. I'm not saying I always practice that, but that that's exactly just it changes that and how you how you feel and and how you can actually interact and, and serve yeah. others. Well isn't that the grace too that we have, right? But I love that, right? It transforms it from a it's all for me or I better fix the future um, to a Jesus is alive and he's living through me and, and my end isn't that I fix everything, but that Jesus is gonna raise us from the dead. So how can I bless in the meantime, work becomes a new thing. Kim. Just thinking of it in relationships and um, just things that maybe have happened in life that have caused hurt, mm. that maybe you have caused hurt. And 
strained relationships or just pain and um, you really have no control over that because of, of what's happened, mm. but that in the resurrection view, that there's hope that Jesus is um, renewing all things mm. and that ultimately in the resurrection, there's going to be that perfect healing and peace. Mm. I love that. Sorry. On relationships, I think with both both of the first two, the personal achievement and the death as a primary reality, there isn't love because I'm, a, or it's the, the air quote love that we mm -hmm. hear about on the radio because mm -hmm. it's you make me feel good, so I want you. Mm. There isn't a, a moving towards someone for their good and, and unless it's transactional. Yeah. But in the resurrection view, I have been bought and I am loved and so I have a place I, I can be a conduit for that love mm. because I know that I'm never going to be able to love the way God loves, but I, I, can, I can let that come out and there is love there mm. even in the face of hurt and th that I am able to love in a way that I can't in the first two. Yeah, yeah, I love that. And even piggybacking off that, I um, remember reading Tim Keller talking about how you then look at that person for what God is making them, not what you can get from them, right? Like, man, I, you know, that was money. If you don't, if you want to read the meaning of marriage um, by him, that, that part right there is, is just dynamite because I'm not looking at, you know, someone for what I can, I can, even in my service, right? Don't we often like look to salve our guilty consciences because I'm the, like, I have to figure this out. Like, I have to make the world a better place. But, but, this transforms us to look at someone as made in the image of God and therefore full of potential and, and that we want them to be part of that story where they're going to be a new creation with us. Like, I mean, I, just, I can't wait till that day when all the brokenness is gone and all of that potential has no more mitigation part of it. Like, it's not you're pushing back on brokenness anymore. It's just purely forward. I mean, in all of us, you know, that's where we're heading. So go ahead, Jessica. Um, I think the first two sound a little more draining, exhausting. Um, oh, yeah. There's some kind of source to fill you up when you're coming out of that resurrection mm. view um, that you don't you don't have anything to, I guess, fill you up and send you out kind of thing. Yeah, that's beautiful. They're tyrants, right? They're false, false gods that are ultimately a tyrant instead of a gracious king. This may not be exactly what you asked, but I, I think about, too, how the world around us isn't neutral in this either because they tell you in your work, we value you because of your usefulness. Mm -hmm. You know, there wow. are a lot of relationships out there that are the same way. Like someone was just saying, it is transactional. Like they, they just very straight up tell you, like, we like you because you're useful, mm -hmm. you know. So we're really fighting an uphill battle here because everything around us just tells us you have to achieve, you have to earn, you have to be useful. Mm. Um, you know, it comes to mind for me because even just trying to take a week off of work, everyone's like, well, who's going to do all this stuff while you're gone? You know, like yeah. as if I'm the only person in the world who could do it. Mm. Um, so they encourage that view. And if you struggle with pride like some of us do, you're like, yeah, I am great. How will they ever live without <laughs> me? <laughs> yeah, <You know>? wow. <laughs> Thank you. That's so good. Anyone else? Oh, Liz. I'll say that kind of piggybacking a little bit um, off of Jess too is that the resurrection view, I mean, that present, there's just so much more hope mm. in that because the first two are dependent upon my own ability and how often do I let my own self down. Mm -hmm. I can't change the laws in the land to change the civil injustices that happen every day. I can't do any of that. So there's very much a, you know, given up, but I think the, the hope that's in the resurrection view is such an anchored hope that in the face of the impossible, it can change. Mm. And I can anchor in that rather than my own ability. Um, I mean, and that comes in the face of, um, you know, dealing with uh, parenting somebody, a child that has tremendous trauma mm. and not knowing if that will ever change or my own trauma, will that ever change or the hope that I see 
like in the, the state of our political arena in this country or in the world, you know, and all of these things. And so I think if I, if I try to, you know, it's a very clear indication of really where am I placing my trust mm -hmm. in anything, yeah. if I want anything to hang, but, but really actually having to anchor in the hope of the resurrection view changes my outlook on everything. Yeah, that is so beautiful. I think some people too like wrestle with, well, does that leave us idle then? Does that leave us idle? Like, do we just like give up and stop working for this to be a better place? And it actually does the opposite because we only know that it will ever happen because of the spirit of the living Jesus. And he also indwells us to make his presence known and appreciated and, and to make like it all a, a sweet fragrance. And man, the spirit isn't going to leave us idle, but he's going to minister through us in grace and love, helping that story be that Jesus, Jesus has already started this and he's going to finish it too. It's, there's no tyranny in walking in the spirit. And it is how we then embody, uh, we embody this resurrection sort of life. Um, so let me just, uh, let me just wrap this up then. So here's the good news. Jesus died and rose to free us and creation from the tyranny of our own inability. Jesus died and rose to give hope of restoration to the world. And Jesus gave us his spirit so we could presently know the power of, of resurrection. Um, in fact, I was even afraid as we talked about this that someone may begin to say, man, I don't live very well in light of the resurrection. Jesus died to free you from that kind of thinking you know, like, and rose again. Like, it's not even performance now in how well we live in light of the resurrection, right? Like, it's a, but it is a, he is alive, and he is right here with us, and present, and he loves us, and all of that stuff that gives us angst in the world, the injustices, the brokenness in ourselves, and the brokenness of others, he cares far more about that than you do. And he loves far deeper than you do. And, and he then meets that brokenness through us, right? But it's not on you anymore. It's not, you are not the Savior. So let me give you that good news. Let me give you that good news today. Jesus died and rose and is with us right here and right now. And I want to invite you, actually, even right now, in leaning into, to, to lean into that a little bit. Let's just take a minute before we head back to the table, because we can begin. I, I get asked this a lot, and I ask this myself. Well, how do, we, how do we start? Like, how do we do that? How do we live? How do we walk in the Spirit? How do we live in light of this? He's here. Let's ask Him, right? Like, I mean, that's how we start, you know? He's right here, and I want all of us to be people that continually press in more and more and more into the reality of the living Jesus, that we would live as if it's actually true. The resurrection is, is real, and it matters, and wholly pressing into its reality and actually living as if it were true is at the heart of Christian maturity. So why don't we just take a minute, and then we'll say our... Uh, our call to um, communion here in a second. So.